forgot to go full screen on that. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see.
And as a result, initial deep space industries missions will probably go to larger asteroids and pick off a few boulders or scoop up some loose regolith uh, for return to Earth orbit. Uh, but the number of uh, asteroids are, are, are huge. If you look at, uh, in the middle of this diagram where we have 100, 100 meter uh, diameter uh, asteroids, there's a, that, that mass somewhere around uh, one and a half to 15 million tons each. Uh, we know of 2,200 of them. We estimate there's 16,000 of them. Um, and these are just in near-Earth space. These are ones that are near-Earth asteroids. <clears throat> um, and, of course, we all know that they can pose uh, hazards as well. Uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest asteroids, massing a trillion tons, well, those hit and it's extinction. Uh, but we can, smaller ones might only destroy a nation or uh, might destroy uh, a state or a city. Um, Apophis, everyone heard of Apophis, the, the asteroid's coming by in 2029 for a close approach. If it hits the right or the wrong keyhole, depending on when you're, you know, um, it'll come back and it could hit Earth in 2036. It's only about uh, 300 meters across. It's barely big enough to wipe out Connecticut. Totally devastate something of that size. It's a small state, but, you know, people who live there, I think it's important. Um, and uh, if it happened to hit the ocean instead, well, so we'd have, uh, you know, 100 meter high, uh, you know, uh, tsunamis hitting all of the coasts of, of that ocean, so, and that would cause trillions of dollars of damage and probably tens of millions of lives lost, maybe hundreds of millions, there's a lot of people who live on the coast of, of the Pacific. Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit about composition and value. Um, there are, of course, the most of the asteroids we're talking about, and we really would like to go after carbonaceous chondrites, which happen to be the most common ones in the outer asteroid belt, and we think they might be a lot more common than people think uh, as near-Earth asteroids. Uh, they have a lot of resources, um, and the water alone in a ton of asteroid ore, ore we think is worth over a million dollars as rocket fuel in higher form. Uh, we think the metals in a ton of asteroid ore are also worth over a million dollars as building materials, uh, platforms, things like that, in higher form. Um, and a little five meter asteroid, a five meter what? Size of B over to the wall? Uh, actually, this is less than that. Um, is, uh, going to be in the order of several hundred tons, uh, so they are, so you don't have to have a big asteroid to have a substantially valuable amount of material. <clears throat> what we want to do for products from asteroid mining, raw mass for basically, mostly yeah, shielding. If you are anywhere beyond low Earth orbit, you need to have radiation shielding, um, and that includes, if you wanted to build uh, a settlement around, let's say, in the, in the L5 point, like the L5 Society was founded to do, you need radiation shielding. You need about 10 tons per square meter of radiation shielding uh, for the, around the entire habitat. Sounds like a lot, but it's a fairly small amount of asteroid. Um, and uh, it means that even leftover slag that has no value for anything else is valuable as radiation shielding. Uh, water and gases, of course, we're talking about those for propellants, uh, also for breathing air, if you want to do that. Uh, lots of metals, platinum group metals, um, and currently if you're talking about a market that's in the geosynchronous orbit, we're talking at present cost of something like $17,000 per kilogram um, to, to launch it up there. So all the, and for example, all the communication satellites that are up there, well they drift. They need certain amount of rocket thrusting every uh, month or so to keep in their, pres their uh, prescribed orbits. When they run out of rocket fuel, they drift out of useful places, and they basically the rules are you have to move it to a parking orbit and turn it off. Um, so the last bit of fuel. If we can supply fuel to do that, and, and a tug to, to move that into the parking orbit, it will save probably 
um, three or four months worth of fuel, which is three or four months worth of operating time, which at five dollar five million a month for the operator adds up to a substantial amount of money. It's worth twenty million dollars of extra income if that fuel is not needed to, to move it to a parking lot. Or of course if we can refuel it for another year, it's even better. <clears throat> um, what we do for mining is simple. You anchor to the asteroid, you excavate some of the regolith, and then you put it to something so you can crush it, separate it magnetically to get the easy nickel iron uh, metal grains out, and bake it to get out the uh, uh, vapors, and we condense those for water and uh, other things. We collect all those useful things. We don't want to throw anything away. Yes? Nothing you just said is simple. So Nothing is simple. None of this is simple. So is there a team that's working on how exactly you're going to anchor and how you're going to excavate the regular? Because there have been teams throughout the decades that have been looking at this. So is there a team in your group that is doing this? Or are you taking other groups' suggestions, proposals, and incorporating it into what your plan is? Both of the above. Okay. Um, we have people working on uh, anchoring techniques. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, I will mention one of those later in the presentation. Um, but we have thoughts about that. It's really difficult to excavate. Um, and uh, so that is a challenge. I will be talking about our proposed electromagnetic asteroid regolith excavator movement. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. But yeah, that's a, that's a challenge. Uh, a lot of these things uh, are a challenge. They've never been done in zero gravity, which uh, there's a, a bunch of things. And it's not just a matter of zero gravity that is the problem. We want to be able to re to you capture everything and recycle it and not bring up any reagents from Earth. You don't want to waste anything. And you want things to be efficient too. So for example, for smelting, instead of on Earth, the way we make iron is we take iron ore, mix it with a bunch of carbon, basically the coke is what they usually use, but it could be any source of carbon, and you heat it up and the uh, uh, the carbon steals the iron, the oxygen from the iron oxides uh, and turns it into carbon dioxide, which we currently throw away. Um, and then the liquid iron comes out and we let it drain off and you uh, get your iron that way. That's how we smell iron. In space, we probably wouldn't do that because we want to capture that CO2 and then convert it back into carbon and oxygen. But that's rather difficult. It takes plants and a long time to do it efficiently. Um, We'll probably use hydrogen as a reducing agent, um, produce water as a byproduct, and water is relatively easy to separate into oxygen and hydrogen, and then we, we, we reuse the hydrogen in the next stage of the process. So the hydrogen becomes a recycled reagent, and we get iron ore in, iron and waste oxygen out. We will have a lot of oxygen as a leftover byproduct. Um, I did a study where we build a habitat and figured out that the steel needed for the habitat itself to just to produce that steel from the magnetite or other iron oxides will free up about 600, enough oxygen to fill the habitat 600 times over. So it's more than we need to breathe. We will have oxygen to burn, so to speak. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. And a lot of these things currently depend on gravity to, to do the separation stuff for us. And then no gravity, we must spin or something. Uh, an important consideration is the definition of ore. Uh, because we've been claiming that asteroids are very rich ore, much richer than anything on Earth. But the definition of ore is not just something valuable. It's something that's valuable enough that you can mine it, process it, and deliver it to a market at a sufficiently high price um, or low cost or both to make money. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a challenge to, to do that in many cases. Uh, on Earth, uranium, uh, $250 per ton of ore is what we get uh, out of uh, uranium mines. Uh, copper, $170 per ton. We can actually make money at very low, uh, you know, very, uh, actually we make money at copper mines that have less than 2%. We can do a half percent and make money. The copper mines south of Tucson uh, do that. Um, but all these things in space, well, geosynchronous orbit, like I said, 17 